Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 211 for Monday, May 13th, 2019. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians. Here we are, working musicians, and here I am in Durham, New Hampshire, Dave Hamilton. Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. Yeah, man. How you doing? Did you work this weekend? Mm, I did. We, um, I've actually had a pretty good string. I had a bunch of good solo acoustic gigs that have been a lot of fun. And then the band played one of our ticketed shows on Saturday night. That went great. You know, we've really got it down to um, a good process now. Like the ticketing process is solid. Um, The woman I have um, who kind of manages the day of events and does the ticket taking and you know, does any sales at the door and that type of stuff. That's butter. You know, our, we had a, you know, our, our, it was fun because it's such a big stage and such a great venue. We had a three, person crew. So Bill, of course, is our sound guy, but he ran on stage. He ran a, he ran a monitor board for us. And then we brought another friend to run in front of the house board. And then a third guy on a crew to run lights. And so it was pretty pro set up and it was really rewarding and the band played great. People loved it. And so I am very happy that that process is now a, a well-oiled machine. I was just going to say, you've got your logistics down. That's great, man. Yeah. Now you got to creative part. add more to it. Yeah. <laughs> it makes it yeah. all well, well, It's yeah. funny because I announced the next one, you know, halfway through the night and put the tickets on sale for the next one, which is only two months away. And so, you know, we're kind of getting in a groove on the stuff. I will tell you one really funny thing. It's a song thing. Yeah. So this audience skewed a little older, you know, I'd say 40 plus typically. Um, The town where we play is a little bit out there, you know, it's kind of rural. Okay. And I think a lot of people use this winery as kind of their, their country club. They hang out there. They, they, it's a large part of their social life. And there were, I could see in the audience, there was like a couple pockets of 20 somethings, right. Which is kind of cool. And again, there's not a whole ton else to do out there. So um, it makes sense to me that, that this was a fun night out for people. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a nice thing to be able to find a place like that where you can, you know, obviously you do the work like we were talking about in the last episode, you, you bring your own people in, but the, the place has its own draw regardless yeah. of who's there as long as they have somebody good. Yeah. Yes. This, and this seems to be working for everybody, but, um, the bulk of our song list is, you know, kind of eighties, you know, a little bit of Motown, less nineties. And, and then, you know, play three or four Bruno Mars songs would be the most current stuff we do. But we started doing um, Give It Away by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You know the song? I, of course. Yeah. I'm trying uh, to think of, you know, in my head, I think of that as like a, a new song, but it's not. It's 20 plus years old. Yeah, but it's still kind of an aggressive feel to it. Very different exactly. than everything else. Yeah, I would say, and that's that's where my pause was. It's like, why do I think of this as a new song? And it's exactly that. It's that aggressive feel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, for us, it's kind of a fun thing because Steve, our bass player, who stays in the back by the drummer, you know, is pretty, you know, in his own thing on stage. He comes up and he really sells a song. I mean, we've done it in, in club dates uh, up to now and it goes over great. He comes up, he's really entertaining. He says, hi, I'm Steve. I'll be your rapper for the evening. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> that's great. And, uh, and then we go into the song and we play it well. Um, but it is such a dramatically different feel that the 40 somethings didn't seem to catch on to this feel. They didn't get the, you know, they didn't go back to that place and, you know, kind of get into it. Some of those 20 somethings did. They knew that's the song. interesting. Cause that's like college music for, for those of us that are 40 somethings. Mm, interesting. I mean, like Red Hot Chili Peppers were a huge band when I was in college. We got in when I say we, I mean, go figure the original band I was in. We were a kind of a we were definitely a funk rooted band, but it was like poppy, happy funk kind of thing. You know, if you blended the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Spin Doctors together, you started to get close to what go figure was. And mm. uh, but we got compared to them all the time because it's what everybody knew. You know, if you had something with a a little bit of a a, a groove, it was like, oh, you're like the Chili Peppers. It's like, well, mm. sure, our bass player's not naked, but you know, that's cool. <laughs> you know, yeah. But it was a lesson that uh, that uh, not every groove 
and every style works in every situation. And you still have to be selective about, you know, where you what you put into sets to really please the crowd. It's true. Yeah. Yep. And and just because a song is good like that, that's important, but it, it also needs to be the right good song. Yeah. 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 And, you know, that one, it, it kind of broke up. We were on a good roll and I put it in purposely because I knew it was going to be a different vibe. Right. Sure. And so I put it purposely after. A, a string of can't miss songs and uh and it just uh you know a lot of people just kind of headed back to their tables and you know it didn't kind of hold it and again we played it fine and steve sang it great and it was fun and uh those who stayed clearly kind of got the irony of it you know right. that the bass player came forward to sing it and it was such a different feel but um yeah i mean you know you just uh live and learn that you know set list there is an art and black magic to uh, to set list design. It, there is. Yeah. I mean, you can hedge your bets in a big way and should. Right. But there's also that just serendipity that sometimes strikes and sometimes doesn't. Yeah. Well, with us, it's it, it's really interesting because I know that there's this healthy tension between the rock side of the band and the funk side of the band, the, the soul side of the band. Right. Sure. You know, and. You know, we are a rock and soul band, both styles, and we get compliments because of the breadth of our of our repertoire. But, you know, there's good natured uh, tension in the band. And it's never been a, an evil thing, but there's sure. good natured tension about which is better. You know, do people dance to funk only? And is funk the better dance music or, you know, or is rock, you know, do stuff for people? You know, and you can extend that to any number of genres. But in our band, it's rock and soul. And um I know that uh, the guys in the band are aware of what songs are bringing people out on the dance floor, what, what songs are, are, are getting people walking back to their tables. And, you know, again, it's not like there's any, you know, sinister, treacherous, you know, discussion that goes on about this. But, you know, it, it is an interesting thing and it affects the vibe of the flow of, of the show. That's that's when it gets into a different discussion. That's when it gets into like, oh, you should have called an Earth, Wind, and Fire song there, right? Sure. So, yeah, yeah, of course. Right. Yeah, it's hard though. I, you know, I mean, you, you certainly learn, as you said, which songs work, which ones don't. But to have a song that sometimes works fall flat, it like you can't second guess yourself based on one data point. Right. Like if, if it if 10 gigs go by and that same song, no matter where it's placed, is the one that sends people back to their tables. Maybe it doesn't even need to be 10. Maybe five is enough to really say, OK, this one just doesn't work for us. What For whatever reason, it ain't working. But if in one night, you know, to say, oh, not enough data, it's not yeah. enough. And, and you can drive yourself crazy with it, too, <laughs> because you can do and I, I know you've done this, but, you know, I've, I think we've all experienced it. You could do a set full of hits, right? Like one after the other. No, like all killer, no filler. Right. And by the fifth or sixth one, you're going to lose people like it, unless unless you just happen to have one of those nights where the energy for everyone, not just you as the band, but also for the crowd. If everybody's really amped for some reason, that can keep people up and like rocking all set. But you can't you can't expect that to happen. There's there. You're going to lose people like it. It. It, it's it's just how the flow of of most of these types of evenings works. Um, and and if you happen to lose people during, you know, song A, well, OK, fine. Like, let's see how they do next gig at song A. And and, you know, we had a we had an uptown gig recently where shout was the song that that like started with the dance floor empty. It was like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> but it was because wait, wait, we wait just, it cleared the dance floor when you started it. People left the dance floor. No, it, well, no, it was, it was the song before had cleared the dance floor, I guess that's true. Yeah. It shout brought him back for sure, but it was weird starting shout with nobody out there. It was like, oh, that is I don't weird. know that this is a good idea, guys. Like, <laughs> This song does not work if we're the only ones doing yes. it, you know, <laughs> um, but thankfully they it, it that that did bring it back. Yeah. So it wasn't shout that cleared it, but it was something equally like, you, you know, it was like we never put shout in an island. Shout would never intentionally be the song that we would use to bring people back. Right. It's sure. usually, you know, the third or fourth in a string of high energy things. And it's like, OK, right. Now we're all in and let's do this. And uh, and for whatever reason, the song before shout, whatever it was, 
was should have kept people on the floor, but did not. This was that I think I talked about it. It was like the first nice, like spring warm night, mm-hmm. and the people could go outside, and so they would. You know, I didn't really blame them because it was a it was a corporate party. They had been there for many hours before we you know before we took the stage. So it was just one of those. Yeah, breaks. corporate yeah. parties are their own thing. It's their own thing. And, yeah, and, and, and what part of the corporate is it, you know like is it sales guys who just want to stand and talk all day about right. their latest sale, or is it the is it the worker bees who want to party and let you know, let loose. So, so, the, you know, and this whole, the skill of reading the audience and, you know, or knowing a, to ask questions about who is this party for before, yeah. and then writing a set list for that, that's, you know, the forethought will help quite a bit. We, this event was about 400 people and um, it was interesting. So we, there's a big stage. It's a, it's a, a event center. There's a big stage, then a big dance floor, and then a giant tent that holds the 40, tables of 10, right? Ah. So you know, imagine between the stage, there's a dance floor, and then everybody's seated out there. So we started with uh, Domino by Van Morrison and people, you know, yeah. I'd say 80 to 100 people came out. Second song, maybe 120, 150. Um, and we, you know, we were kind of rolling early on. Third song was Pretty Woman. I think the second song was 24 Karat by Bruno Mars. Um, third song was Pretty Woman. We had, you know, good crowd. Yep. And then it was really interesting to watch literally – songs would you'd see everybody marching towards the dance floors you know uh jet airliner did that for us it was a huge it's crazy how well that song works (laughs) yeah it shouldn't but it does everybody knows it everybody can sing it yep we're doing uh working my way back to you oh Um, yeah yeah Yeah. the four top song yeah um, and again you can see like ants they're marching forward and then there were some things that just you know either it was the nature of the event was people want a break. And so they just kind of stream back after four or five songs. That's enough, you know? Uh, yeah. Oh. And that's it. That's enough. It doesn't matter what you're playing. They decide as you're ending the previous tune, I need a break and they walk away and it can be, unless it's truly their favorite song. They it, rarely can you get them to turn back around and, Absolutely. and you need to give them that break. Like you need to build those things into your set list so that you can control that flow. Right. Yeah. You know, and that that's why those breather songs are breather songs, you know, and and there's good breather songs. And then there's breather songs. Nobody knows that could be good songs. But it, if nobody knows them, it's a it's a risk. But like we started, we've been playing My Girl is a nice little breather, but it's also, you know, a buckle polisher. Right. You, you know, mm-hmm. if people want to slow dance, there you go. Slow dancing is getting to be a thing of the past. I think there's there's just not depends on the gig for a corporate party. Absolutely. You know, yeah. if you've got an older These are crowd, friends. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right, right. Yes, if it, yeah, it's the older, the older crowd. Like the fundraiser we just did, absolutely. You know, because people are there with as couples, and and it and it works. But yep. um, what else? Oh, we're, we started doing shallow. Doing, we started doing shallow. That um, yeah, Gaga, whatever. Well, it's it's, it's yep. one of the biggest songs on the planet right now, right? It is, and you know, it's a weird tune to play at a party gig. It has to be that breather tune. But it really can get people like it builds nicely toward the end. And it, it can be kind of a nice, you know, step out of that, uh, that, that breather moment, right? You do a my girl and then shallow. And then at, at the end of shallow, the energy's up enough that you could drop into like an uptown funk right away or, you know, something energetic like that. So, yeah. 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 We started doing um, new sensation by NXS. Yeah. What a great tune. It- it really is a great tune, but again, not everybody knows it. Yep. And so that was a good example of a tune on this night where, uh, so our first five songs were Domino, 24 Karat, Pretty Woman, Dancing in the Streets, the um, kind of Bowie, yep. um, Jagger version, and then New Sensation. New Sensation, definitely. So after four you know, pretty well-known songs, it, it drifted them off a little bit. Then Jesse's Girl, which usually is a, a, a floor filler, was just was just okay yeah. and then we did let's groove by earth wind and fire and you know then then started then getting ready to come back yeah you need that you you have to expect when you give them or if they take like well, either way but when when there is that break it is rarely a one song break you you need to expect it to be two so if people have left the dance floor at the end of whatever song number four into song number five don't try to bring them back with song number six. You, you know, give yourself if, if song if on the list song number six is something that you know really like is like a shout or something. I, I would interject yet something else there as an audible to give them that breather so that they can come back and 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 use it. I mean, and and these are the things you got to think about. It's because yep. 
because it it can make for uh, it can make or break the night term in terms of perception. You know, I mean, if if the band's playing well, you know, that's that's a whole different thing. But uh, well, but uh, you know, you you control. Let's put a number on it. You control seventy five percent of the vibe that's happening. Mm-hmm. The music is is, but there are twenty five percent intangibles. Is it outdoors? Is it getting cold? Is is dessert being served? Is right. it you know? Uh, is there a big birthday party that they deserve the cake? You know, or something like that. Yeah, right. There's yeah, a bunch something of other that's more important than you. Yes, at that moment. At, at that, that one moment. moment. Yep. That's right. But, uh, you know, but we do like to think that we control 100 percent of the of the vibe. But, you don't. Uh, I don't think no, we don't. No. And and it actually I think it's a good thing, especially at those corporate gigs. But really anywhere, it, it is a good thing to accept that some of the vibe isn't yours to control. Most of it is. And you should. Right. Put in the effort to do that. And and as I always say, you know, a, a, a good set is an exchange of energy back and forth between you and the crowd. But you need to assume that you are the one that has to start that exchange. Right. It's, yeah. uh, it, you know, sometimes you get lucky and the crowd just feeds it to you and that's great, but you have to walk on stage, assuming it's your job to kick the kickstart that and get it going. Um, I know. I totally agree. So, so just to finish out this first set. So yeah. Jesse's girl, a new sensation were kind of like, eh, you know, fine. There were some people out, not, not overwhelmingly let's groove, got him going. Then Billy Joel's, you may be right. Nice. Got him going. But then interestingly, I can't go for that. The Hall and Oates tune, which is one of the killer dance grooves i think of all time usually kills for us but again it's that kind of mellower I was feel say it's a little slower Quieter. it's not well and it's not 120 either right right it's right. it's it's about 105 110 or something like that and i right like that's it, it i've seen that go both ways i've we've used that as like the second of two breather songs right so mm-hmm. you you know you do your breather and then you do that and by the end of it people are like oh yeah this is moving like i can i can move to this and now you've got them and 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 up you can go yeah i could see that yep, yep. so anyway that was it was okay and then w- one song that's been working great for us for a couple of years is fly by sugar ray we kind of have our own arrangement to it added horns to it nice and uh and you know the horns have a little shtick that they do and it's just fun uh and it, it's something that people enjoy seeing us do so that started to build it back up again then sign seal delivered uh, and then going to Motown for working my way back to you. And, you know, then the energy was good. And then we did our one and only slow song of the night, what you won't do for love. Bobby Caldwell tune. Okay. And that's again, I think you owe your crowd one slow song a night. I rarely have, I, you know, our club dates or anything like that, you know, second set, there's just no need for a, for another slow song that I've, that I've found. So we do one and we've been doing, you know, um, let's get it on for years. Sure. We do um, yeah, yeah, yeah. tenderness, you know, but it, it is a, it feels like you should have one slow song per night. Yep. And so this year, what you won't do for love, Nick sings are great. And, you know, the band plays a great long solo for Mendoza. Saxel is cool. But it, again, it was, um, it was a gift to the finite number of people who felt comfortable slow dancing. Right. Right. Finite number of people. Yep. And it always often is a finite number. Yep. Yeah. I'll give you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then after that, Jet Airliner, you know, it was like, again, you saw the ants, like people yeah. literally were filing out. Then Back in Love Again, uh, September, and then Dance in the Dark was the end of the first set. Oh, nice. That's good. Yep. We started opening our second set uh, with a, a song that's relatively new to us, but it it just worked. And it was actually it was one that, that you and I talked about here and, and had some question as to whether it would work. And it's, um, oh, now I, I set it all up and I can't, uh, uh, Mama Don't Dance is uh, mm-hmm. the Loggins and Messina tune. Man, what a, th- I mean, talk about ants to the stage, right? You know, that it's cool because it starts with that halftime groove. I mean, it's the same riff, but the drums are in halftime. It's don't, but I don't, 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 but I don't, don't, right? And then as soon as it kicks in, your mama don't dance and your daddy don't, right? You know, and it's, it, man, it, people are just right there. As li- and it's got to be the right tempo, right? It's got to bop is what mm. that tune needs to be. And as long as that tempo's right, where it, it, it just kind of bops along, man, people have so much fun with it because everybody knows that song. Is it? And that, so that's it. it it's uh, familiar. Would you consider that an oldie any more than anything else is an oldie? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I it's, would. it's a very, it is older than I most. Say hokey, but it's, it's, um, it's that overtly poppy type of thing, right? Correct. Correct. Yes, absolutely. It's it right. It's very poppy. Well, I mean, it's it's Loggins and Messina. Right? Well, it, it, I guess you know it's probably the same as as Domino, right? It is just a familiar groove with a very familiar yeah 
refrain and and you just people can get into it. Yep. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, nobody, I, I guess by playing that song, perhaps it's exactly that, y- you know, hokey might be the wrong word, but it might actually be the right word. You're up there sort of admitting that, look, this, it's okay to have fun with this song. Right. And then everybody's like, awesome. Because we like to have fun with this song, you know, but it's, it's a guilty pleasure. If, if you a will. guilty pleasure. Yep. We're doing, um, but it's, but it's a doing... shared guilty pleasure. Like it's not a vanity song by any stretch. Well, <laughs> but, but you know, you'd sh- almost put it in, it, you'd almost put it, except that the vocals are so much, you know, better. Yeah. You'd almost put it in the same musical feel as Johnny be good. Right. Yes, it, it is. That's, but the vocals are so much better. That's right. So yep. much better. Yeah. Yep. We're yep. doing, um, we're doing never can tell the, the uh, Chuck Berry song. Oh, right? wow. You know? Yeah, sure. And, uh, you know, again, we added a horn line to it. We added a, you know, a, a, a long solo section where four or five guys take a solo. Then we, it's the only song in our set now. And I, it, by, by design where there's a section where all five, Horns are doing kind of a Dixieland all in oh, horn nice. solo feel. Oh, yeah. So one time for the show, you can't do that every, you know, every song, but no. it's just one like way to kind of show off the horns in the band. And, you know, it's pretty effective and it's funny to me. And I, and I bring this up only because it's, I think it's the same thing. Oddly, there are people who see us play that that is the song of, more than other things, like they come, are you going to play, are you going to play Chuck Berry today? You know? Yeah. It's like, well, well all nobody, this, you nobody know. sees a horn section, like break out into that Dixieland thing. Like that's a cool thing to see. Yeah. 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 So I can see that. Yeah. 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 That's cool. But that's cool. I, I would agree with you when Acoustic Manus says mama can't mama, your mama don't dance. Yeah. Um, you know, people turn around, you know, it is, it's that catchy. It is that catchy. That's exactly what it is. It it's like you you can't yes, it's a guilty pleasure because you think, oh, I shouldn't like this song. But the reality so is smile. everybody likes that freaking song. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yep. You can't guilty not, pleasure. It's a guilty that, pleasure. Yeah. There's there's the there's the uh, title for this week. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Shared guilty pleasures is what it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Um, we had uh actually several emails from listener Kevin. And and I want to share snippets of each because he highlighted some really good things that uh, some of which are are actually the first one certainly uh, stems out of our iPad on stage discussion. And he says, uh, I don't generally use an iPad on on stage and I rarely use cheat sheets, he says, but I do have a set list. He's there. He's there. I don't know if he's their band leader. I think he is. But he's certainly the one on stage that runs the set for what, you know, however that fits into their their hierarchy in his band. Uh, and he says, since I'm the person who makes sure we're staying on time. So I sometimes skip songs or sometimes add songs. I've noticed show photos where I'm staring at the set list and not heads up. He says, it's been a much more difficult habit to break since I've probably been doing it for years and didn't realize it. He says, Mm. so it's not just iPads. It's pretty much anything that you have in front of you that can be a visual distraction. And, you know, it's funny reading this. I, I definitely am guilty of the same thing. I've caught myself doing it in fling. I, I tend not to have an iPad on stage. I, you know, I know the tunes and it's just not necessary. If I have one, it's for sound and I usually turn it off if, if I don't need it, but I have caught myself staring at our set lists thinking, you know, here we are in the bridge of this tune. All right. What's, what's listed to be next. Is that the right choice? And if the answer is "Mm, maybe not or no, then it's all right. Let me look at the rest of our, all our songs. What would be the right thing to do next? You know, and and it, anything can be that visual distraction, right? It's it's um, you got to be careful with that stuff because it's easy to get lost. Anything you can look at. I mean, like the the classic one is looking at your fretboard or looking at your keyboard, right? You know, it and you have to learn to not look at that stuff except in those moments where you have to, right? You know. Um, but but I I think that the comment is smart is like, if you are too lost into not engaging your audience, yes, anything is, is not good. So, you know, you would make the argument either way that a guitar player focusing on his fretboard, it's, you know, it's generally, I think most, most rhythm players should be able to figure things out, but you know, if you're playing a solo or something, that's different. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But you still have but to dumb. emote it. You have to make it look like whatever you're playing is more difficult than it actually is. Right. I mean, you, uh, you perform the solo. Right. It's a show. Yeah. yeah. But the, the issue about looking at set lists is interesting because 
Um, yes, you have to train yourself to, and the best thing to do is train yourself to look and grok three, four, five songs at a time. So you don't have to look at it every single time. Correct. Right. Correct. That's one thing. Yes. Um, but it is a funny thing. Then once you are aware of it and you watch a band and you see everybody looking down, you know, several times uh, in the breaks between different songs, it really gets you. It really is annoying. Yeah. And, then and you so, then you become that that guy we talk about that stands in the back of the room with your arms folded, judging the, yeah, the band on stage. Sure. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's a whole I, other different thing you need to be aware of. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, uh, you know, the, the mysticism of the set list. I can't tell you how many times I have looked down at a set list, looked down at a set list, told myself, here's the next song. And I missed a song. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, we're, we're on sure. we're on song three. Uh, we're about to play song three. I'm looking at the set list. OK, OK. And I call song four and the rest of the band is like, what the heck is going on? And um, or start song four. Right. Uh, and, you know, I, I think most guys have done that in, in the band that whoever has a responsibility for starting a, a song. But oh, I, I saw Rush do that at the New Haven Coliseum, like 15,000 you know people. How did I know? Because they, they Getty announced the song. He said, uh, we're going to play lock and key. And he turns around. He's like, what's that? And you, you can see Neil yelling something at him. Neil doesn't have a vocal mic, so it, it was not audible to, to us, you know, halfway back the floor or whatever. He's like, right. That's the song after this one. This next tune is Territories. And in they went. Yep. <laughs> but I think, you know, relative to the comment, the, the key is to glance, take in three, four or five songs at a time. Be aware that, that's what, that you're trying to do that. You're consciously trying to get your eyes off of the set list. Yeah. Right. And not be a you know a slave to those types of things because everything I think when you're on stage, everything is about the audience. Everything, every moment, you know, is how to be more engaged. You're performing, be, yeah. yeah, yeah. Always be, always be. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can get away if there are things where you know, like you are going to be into what you're playing. If the band's got, you know, it, like like I've seen prog rock bands do this where. Where, you know, there might be a passage that's very difficult and you kind of need to be into your instrument. Well, then you have some something going on with your light show that adds something to, you know, to be visibly distracting or visibly interesting. Yes. Uh, you know, during those moments. That's when you are in an elevated, you know, that's when you really have your stuff together. Right. When yeah. Literally yeah. those parts of the show where the band needs to, you know, gl glance down for a few seconds. What is happening to keep the audience engaged while the rest of the band is reloading? That's that's a band that really has their stuff together. Yeah, but you kind of have to. I mean, that that's the you know, in order to su succeed as a as a band that that plays difficult material that requires you to kind of all, you know, pull in. Now, if you can look at each other and make that interaction interesting, that that can be interesting. Right. You don't always have to be focused like like looking at the crowd interacting with one another yeah, can be interesting absolutely. to watch, right? Like you don't have to ignore the guys on stage that can actually be part of the show and, and really draws people in, you, you know, so don't, yeah, don't dismiss that, but, but just be aware that, okay, if you're going to have a conversation with another bandmate, is it a conversation you can have on the microphone where it makes it interesting? Like that rush thing, right? That was a mistake. Now, Neil couldn't have it on the mic, but Getty made sure it was on the mic. Cause he knew, Oh, Everybody's no. Everybody knows something is going on here. I need to, you know, show my half of the conversation, and and he did, and it was interesting, right? Here it is, whatever. Thirty years later, it's it's still. Do you think it's a big memory. deal? Do I think? What do you a think? It, deal? Or like that moment with Rush? Yeah. Did it actually make the the in the moment the humanness of the air? Was that worth more than them playing the the songs? You know, without incident. Yeah, I think so. Of course, I, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, because they're a band on stage, right? Like they, they're not you're not just going to listen to someone play the record, even though many have argued that going to see a rush show, you're basically listening to a band playing the song exactly like the record or trying to. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, but, you know, no. And in, in that moment, it was like, oh, no, here's here's two people having a conversation before they play a song together. Like, that's cool. Yeah, they're a band. I, I, so let's let's, yeah. let's let's flesh that out a little bit. What are, what are those interaction techniques that can happen. I, I introduce the band. Sometimes I wait till, you know, almost the end of the show and do it over a, some kind of a musical vamp. But last sure. night or Saturday night, just we did something and the horns really were kicking it. And so I just decided to introduce the horns then 
And then I did the rhythm section a little bit later in the night and no music underneath and just really took a time to talk about the guys, which I've been doing a little bit more because it's the, you know, the 20th anniversary. And I just, you know, want to take a time and kind of call out a different guy each night and spend a little more time on their introduction as we go along. Just a little bit, not, not a lot. But that's, you know, one thing that that uh, is a good re- reset time. You know, band introductions is not bad. Um, you know, I've had conversations I, I on stage. I mean, if you have truly good banter amongst, you know, you and and other another bandmate or other bandmates, that can be really interesting it, as long as it's interesting. Right. I mean, it, it can't be everybody, boring. Well, everybody thinks they're interesting. right? It, yeah. But you kind of need some self-awareness there. Like it, it can't be a boring conversation. It, it has to be witty and, and punchy and interesting. But, you know, a lot of the things I noticed this, it was actually Bowling for Soup that taught me that this was OK, because those guys. Well, first of all, Jarrett Reddick can and does go and do like stand up comedy. Right. So mm. he he definitely understands timing and all of those things that are that, you know, you sort of learn when you're a comic um, and he brings those to the stage with Bowling for Soup without question. But what it made me realize is especially like with our acoustic gigs, but I've done this in in electric gigs, too. You know, sometimes you'll step away from the mic and, and have a conversation or something and you'll laugh, you know, with each other. Like you'll ha- you'll think of a funny thing to tell the other guy. And as long as it's it's, you know, within the realm of things that are appropriate to say into a microphone in front of a crowd, it's way better to have that conversation, it, even though it's the same conversation. I'm not saying it to the crowd. I'm saying it, you know, in monkey fist. I'll hey okay, Johnny D, you know, and I'll, I'll tell him something I thought of during the last song or whatever. And, and and he'll respond and react. And it brings the crowd into that instead of the crowd just seeing two guys sort of laughing on stage. Which is good to see, you know, a band interacting with each Mm -hmm. other like that's that's not a bad thing. But if you can bring the crowd into it, it like it totally pulls that interaction and it doesn't need to be a, you know, hey, folks, I'm the leader. I want to point you over there. I mean, that works, too. Right. Like the band introductions thing or whatever. But this is just like two guys having a conversation. We're just having it on the microphone so everybody can hear. And uh, and if you've got that rapport with somebody like Aaron and I and Fling have it, uh, Russ occasionally has that in Fling. Johnny and I definitely in in Monkey Fist have it. Uh, and it it really becomes part of the show. It it it's but you have to have that rapport. Right. I mean, I I podcast three times a week and I've done this for, you know, 14 years. So I'm sort of used to talking with people. If you and I were on stage, we'd probably have a very easy time having a few of these moments every night. Right. If, uh, but if your band doesn't have that and, and there's no one in your band for you to do that with, then, then don't force that just, but if you, I would say, if you catch yourself having those off mic conversations, ask yourself, could I have had that on the mic? And you'll start to to learn which ones will work and, and which ones definitely won't. Sometimes there's those things. You notice something about somebody in the crowd. You want to say it privately to your bandmate. Keep that private. That's important. But but sometimes that can be funny. Like if you point out, hey, look, there's the guy filming us with a, a huge iPad. You know, he's got a 13 inch, 12 inch iPad, or whatever, filming us like you can make a, a funny, you know, group moment of that. Like, yeah. oh, how do you fit that in your pocket? Like, we're you know, those kinds of things. And you can have this conversation like, hey, do you see the guy over there? with the thing and it's like that can be funny so yeah. in fling or in uptown um is any part of the leader vibe talking about the song or the artist that you're covering so like, uptowns you know, rarely that that starts to get very I, I have well what's the right way for me to say this as a, a spectator i find that uninteresting 99% of the time it it seems very self-absorbed for a, an artist to tell me why this next song means so much to them um, mm. so let me let me ask a, because it's not way. about you it's like you're playing especially if they're playing cover songs it's like okay well great you know you didn't write the freaking tune i don't need yeah. to hear about it you know what i mean like just go play the song yeah so interesting so i i I use it a little bit differently. So, for example, I'll turn around and say, hey, Horns, what time is it? And they'll all yell back, it's Stevie Wonder time. And then we'll play Sign Seal Delivery sure. or something like that. So that type of thing. Oh, that's and, fine. Yeah. And yeah, I'm yeah. like, who's that's in the mood shtick. for some Bruno Mars tonight? Right. That type of thing. And, and that type of thing. Yeah, that, the, this song is important to me. That that 
seems a little bit misplaced, but yeah. it does seem like a, a useful um, tool for, for, you know, for, we get asked a lot, like, you know, what do you guys say to an audience? How does a leader lead? You know, you know, what do you do? Yeah. I, I find that, that, that is a little bit helpful because it's a little bit breaking down that fourth wall. Like, you know, let, let's not, we're not doing, this isn't brain surgery. Right. We're playing covers. So let's, let's enjoy the, the journey of playing covers together. And so it'll be a little bit like, I, I, I might say like, you know, this is a beautiful song from the seventies. You know, we don't play too many slow songs, but this is one we're real excited to do for you. We, we might, I might do that. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I will use the artists that we're covering in some way a few times through the night as just a, a, a device to talk to the audience. Yeah. I, yeah. And I, that, I mean, all the examples that you, that you sort of showed, I, I, I like that, that, that makes sense. It keeps it entertaining. It's like, it's when somebody says, Oh, you know, when I was a boy, this song meant so much to me and it really is, you know, it's so special that, for me to be able to cares? bring it to you. It's like, um, excuse me, who paid who tonight? You know, like what's going on here? Yeah, I don't need to hear that. Who ca- Who cares? <laughs> it's exactly. But like, it is pretty useful because, you know, like in the Bay Area, you know, Santana's from the Bay Area. We got to a place last night and I said, sure, uh, we haven't played any Santana. You know, if you want to get an audience to scream at you, yell out a popular artist name. Of course. And you will get you will get some feedback that is really useful. Yeah, Helps no, that's energy. totally that's really smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And we've done we've done things. I don't know if we do them in fling or not. Probably. But, you know, we did it in the responders a lot. We'd get people to, you know, who do you like better? The Beatles, the Beatles or the Stones? Yeah. Which do you want next? Right. And and you can kind of get people cheering and then you and you play both. Right. You, right. you know, and it's fine. You just pick which order you do them in based on, you know, how people are cheering. So but uh, but yeah, no, like that works great. It's it's just the the self-absorbed kind of thing that, morose yeah 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 it's like dude no hubris no, no. yeah leave that somewhere else that's right yeah you know, yeah you know. funny uh where are we here you know um two other things well one other thing from kevin I, I don't know where we'll get uh with any of this because it always tends to meander but um but he talked about something that i think is really important and it's instrument insurance and he mm-hmm. asked what we do to insure our instruments uh because Instrument insurance is should be it should be obvious why this is important. You're bringing your instruments out. You know, you're they're in your car. They're at a club. They might get stolen from one of those places. They also might get damaged in the process of using them in in one of those places. But it gets tricky getting instrument insurance because um, you are using this away from your home for hire. Yeah, it's and not part of your homeowners, uh, you know, not by default. It. Right. If if you are if you are a professional musician in any definition an insurance company can find, it, I know it, it, my insurance company makes it very very clear. Anything you're using for a professional purpose is definitely not covered. So the obvious question is, what about the ones I don't use for a professional purpose? And it's a little bit of a gray area that it you have to gray. prove that you don't have to, right? Yeah. But there well, are a but, couple so of really I, reputable. Well, I I do it with my homeowners insurance, and I I have for for many decades. But I do it as a, with a rider to my homeowners policy. It's a listed items thing, similar to what you might do for jewelry, right? Where you specify the exact item, you have it appraised or some uh, somehow you know log its value. Um, and your insurance company can work with you on stuff like this if you bought instruments used or whatever, and you don't just have a simple receipt. Like don't don't just abandon all hope there there is a way yeah. through this but but you need to be very clear that you are using this away from the home for hire and and depending on your insurance company they may or may not offer a rider like this but if they do it will cost more than it would for something you know that you just have at home like your jewelry the cool part about it is if you can get your homeowners to do this or your renters insurance it would be a very similar thing to the policy Often that coverage starts at dollar one and is not subject to your deductible. So like my drums are covered at dollar one at every club and it's super cheap. I mean, I think I'm paying, I mean, it's like maybe a hundred bucks a year for Mm. this. I mean, I have, you know, like I've got some discounts baked into my policy because we haven't had a claim in in a long time and things like that. Right. But, uh, but you can do it through your homeowners, but you have to be, very clear because they're an insurance company. So when they have to pay out on a claim, they're going to investigate that claim. And if they see, <laughs> oh, you're doing this for hire, 
uh, you did not put that on your policy. Guess what? You don't get paid. Uh, but there, like you, you were going to talk about some or at least acknowledge that there are some standalone companies out there. that. Yeah, I was kind of going through email what we're doing here, but yeah. um, my local guitar store re- referred me to a, a company that specifically does um, uh, instrument insurance. I can't find it right now. I'll get it. And we can post it in the show notes. But, OK, cool. Um, yeah, there are companies out there that specifically will do that. I mean, basically, you take an inventory. You, you know, give stuff a value, you send them a list, they'll send you back a quote. And most of the stuff can be done, can be done over, um, uh, over email. Yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, it makes sense. You, you know, th- there are concerning numbers of posts I see on social media of musicians who have lost stuff to theft and it's, you know, it's criminal and it's terrible. It makes sense to have your stuff insured. I mean, you know, I don't know if, if someone's, you know, if you're, if your number is bound to come up, I don't know what the uh, how much this happens, but it sure seems like it's quite a bit. It happens. Yeah. 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 I mean, I saw a bass player named Larry Lange. He was Delbert McClinton's guy uh, for a long time before he passed. But um, but I played a gig with him on Sixth Street in Austin and he put his amp out uh, on the street and uh, and went in to get like the next thing. And somebody took his amp, threw it in their truck and, oh, and drove off. And it was like, are you can he And he, you know, his, his comment was, man, that sucks. And I'm like, oh, was it a good amp? He's like, no, he's like, the amp wasn't worth anything. He's like, but John Belushi did Coke on the back of that amp when we played uh, Saturday Night Live. He's like, there's history there. It's like, okay, well, yeah, man. Oh, well, you know, he was, he was okay with it, but it sucked. I'm like, is it insured? He's like, yeah, it's insured. He's like, everything's mm-hmm. insured. But he's a, you know, he was a career touring musician. So he had solved this problem because it, it is a matter of when, not if, right. You know, it's something's going to happen. And um, yeah, yeah. But uh yeah. So if you know of an insurance company that you use that is available to, you know, folks around the country or whatever, let us know. Right. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. dot com. We'd love to uh, we'd love to share that so that we kind of can help people get uh, get in the right the right spot there, because it yep. it's important. I think I think Agreed. I think um, but any more on that or uh, or no, I got to dig out that link and I'll get it. And OK, share sweet. It. Yeah, cool. And then Kevin um, brought up a, a, a one last point that, you know, I, I think about it every time I do a gig, especially with Uptown with weddings, but I never really thought to talk about it on the show. And he says, storage for your cases at a venue. He says, somehow after all these years playing wedding receptions, we've never run into a problem until today. He says, we were bringing the lights forward so we can store behind the backdrop that we'll lose some of the stage uh, for the front of the bar. He says, I'm now adding this to my checklist. And really what he's talking about is he he never had to think about a place to as to where to store all of his cases. Uh, I guess clubs that and venues that he's played have always had some back room or something because it's it. You know, when you're playing at a club and it's a bar gig, you can often get away with having your cases sort of tucked in a corner of the stage or, or yeah. whatever. When you're playing a wedding or a corporate gig and. That stuff cannot be visible in in most scenarios. You know, I've never thought about this because when we do a wedding, and it's not even in my rider. So when we do a wedding, because it's we're usually there for many hours, and because uh, we're usually I do put meals into our rider. Yep. Um, you know that implies that they put us in some kind of a green room, and that green room is where we usually store our stuff. And that and that I I, I fortunately have never run into it, but it sounds like I should put that green room into our rider and make sure it's in there. Yeah, having some or storage the, facility. No, the the green room is a great one. Sometimes, uh, you know, the green room can be a floor away, like a staircase away from yeah. where you're playing, and then that can start to be kind of a, a drag to have to haul all your cases up. So we've started doing um, in in Uptown. I mean, I say we've started. They were doing it long before I joined the band. They have a backdrop. It's a black backdrop that they put up. Um, it's a little truss. You could put lights on it, but they don't, they have lights on, on, you know, we have a different truss for lights and it's just a backdrop with a black cloth and we can put it at the back of the stage. And even just a couple feet off the wall, we can fit everything behind it. No problem. Cause the stage is a really wide thing, right? If you use that space wisely, um, you can, you know, you can tuck everything and it looks better. It's funny. The last gig we did, we didn't need it because the our green room was right next door. So we're like, oh, screw it. Just put all the cases over there. No problem. And uh, 
And then I, I look, I walked into the room later and to look at the stage and it was like, you know, this would look much better if we had that black backdrop up, <laughs> mm. but we didn't put the it up thing, because we didn't need it. Yeah. The other thing you can do is, especially if you're playing weddings and you're in a hotel or, you know, some venue that's providing a stage. Yeah. They yeah. usually skirt the stage and you can stick stuff under the stage. You can stick stuff under that's yes. Sure. It just depends on how, how high the stage is and, and how yeah. thick your cases are and things like that. But yeah, we've gotten away with that too, where you just, you know, if there's room, um, either under the stage or sometimes behind the stage. Like if the stage is separated enough from whatever the wall behind you is, that can also be a kind of a nice place to sort of secretly tuck things that, that uh, you can have at arm's length or at arm's reach, but, but never. Um, yeah. And never then have to deal with actually what we often do for many of our gigs. So Bill, our sound guy, we have a trailer, right? And trailer yep. has all our sound gear in it. When the, when the trailer is empty, we throw, we throw cases into the empty it, trailer. Yeah. If your load in is close to where the stage is right. or whatever. Yep. For sure. Yeah. 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 That's the other place to put them. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a drag having to like, you know, go down two flights of stairs with cases if that's the scenario. And I'm sure that's what happened with Uptown uh, uh, early enough and often enough that Gary was just like, OK, no, 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 no. I'm buying a curtain. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? I think we've been getting so many um, notes and feedback and all that type of stuff. I would love to put it out to our listeners. Help us develop the ultimate writer. So if you oh. have a good writer, just email it to us so we can pull out, you know, cool things and share stuff like, like this would be an interesting one. Does your writer, you know, contain something for storage of cases? Um, so if everybody listening out there can share their writer with us, if you don't mind, you know, we can pull out the stuff that is yeah, kind we'll, of different and, we'll, and we'll, assemble, we'll keep you know, it. the ultimate writer. Yeah, we'll anonymize it. We we will we will only pull out just generic clauses or re, or, you know, rewrite them such that it doesn't identify your band or anything. But, yeah, if we can crowdsource this together, that's a great idea. That'd be fun. Oh, yeah. Feedback. Be helpful, too. Yeah, totally. Yeah, because, you know, like Kevin says, I mean, I was, as I was reading his email, I'm like, oh, man, the guys in Uptown figured this out before I ever met him. You know, like right. this was just a done deal. If only. Right. You know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So and, share your writer. And yeah. And food. And, you know, do you do you uh, when when you put, you know, the band gets fed in there, do you have any minimum requirements for that? Right. We played a gig. God, this was awful, man. We played this gig at a very posh country club in this area. And, uh, and you know, the, the the guests were getting fed like lobster tail and, and fillets or whatever, which is fine. And uh, and, you know, it's the catering business. Right. So they have like vendor meal level one, two and three or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping what we got was vendor meal level one, because if it was anything above that, I don't want to see what's below it. <laughs> they brought us. God, this is awful. Pay, pay close attention to what I say here because I'm not going to skip anything and I'm not going to miss anything. It was a plate with French fries, a bun and a burger. Mm. There was no ketchup. There was no <laughs> tomato on the burger. They didn't put an onion on the burger. It was a plate with fries, a bun, two, two buns. Like, you know, they, they cut the bun in half and the burger was on, on, on the bun there. Yeah. We had to ask him for ketchup. They brought out one dish. Of oh catch up for us all to share. We're like, you know, we're I have a couple more. of guys <laughs> in the house rockers who are lifelong musicians. They've been, you know, yeah. they make their living through music and they tell amazing stories about when they do corporate gigs or weddings, yeah. that they bring giant, you know, plastic bags and they, whatever they go up to the catering staff and whatever they can take after, after it's left over, <laughs> you know, that's a meal for a couple of days. Absolutely. They have, they have perfected the, you know, how to squeeze more out of less. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you can, right. You can, because if, if you, you know, remembering that the catering staff or, you know, whatever, they're all on the same level as you, right? You know, for you're sure. all peons in the grand scheme of things, except for those moments when you are the most important person, like when the catering staff is bringing out food. Now, suddenly they're very important, right? When the band's playing, suddenly you're very important. But up until that moment, you ain't nothing, right? You know, and, and if you can sort of, you know, leverage that brotherhood, that camaraderie with the the rest of your, you know, working class, your brethren. worker bee brethren. Yeah. yeah, you can you can get a lot out of it for sure. Solidarity. Solidarity. Yeah, we had it was um, uh, it was one another place we played. We you know, it were there were eight of us in the band 
at the time, uh, this was like a year ago, we had a horn player. So there was our sound guy, the six of us sound guy and horn player. And they brought out six meals uh, and it was vendor meal. It might've been vendor meal too. It wasn't quite the, you know, fries, bun, burger. It was fries in a nice little tin and a burger with like lettuce, tomato, onion on it and, and things. And they brought out six of those. And we're like, we need two more. And they're like, oh, crap. I'm like, yeah, there's eight of us. They're like, oh, OK, it, it'll take a couple of minutes, but we'll we'll get you something. And so it was Vic and I, the bass player and I that that, you know, I, that had to wait. It was like, fine. Everybody was really nice to us. They're like, hey, do you want, you know, some fries or whatever? Like, no, no, you guys eat while it's warm. You know, we'll, we'll be fine. It's like we're all it, it doesn't matter. We're all kind of suffering together here anyway. It doesn't. Yeah, you know, whatever. And uh, so 10 minutes goes by or whatever, and everybody's mostly finished with their stuff and they bring us the things and, you know, they're covered in the, 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 the tops of the trays so that you can take off the thing mm -hmm. and, you know, it stores it and keeps it hot while they're carrying it around or whatever. And they bring it out and they open these two tops in front of Vic and I, and it's this gorgeous, we each have this gorgeous filet, beautiful mashed potatoes and asparagus. And we're like, oh yeah. And the guys are like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, this is for the rhythm section. Like this is how it's supposed to be. This is, this seems right to me. I don't have any complaints about this. <laughs> <And they're> like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but, but somehow that's how, you know, sometimes that's just how it works out. Yeah. So, but yeah. I, and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Those, those burgers were something else. We were like, man, I can't, I, you know, I know that the people who did the event picked vendor meal one. I don't think I don't blame them for it being, you know, a plain dry burger. That's yeah. that's the the kitchen Venue. managers. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Like that's would you serve that to your your own staff? I don't think so. You know, Crazy. yeah. <laughs> But it certainly gave us a fun story to to experience and and then that's, share. That's what you Here. bad meal, good story. Bad, bad meal, good story, and then we went out and rocked the house, so it was fine. There you go. Yep, yep, yep. It's good. Well, thanks, Kevin, for all that that great feedback, and you know we appreciate your interest in the in uh, gig gab. And so every time we get these messages, they help fuel the content. You know, we talk about our gigs and our experiences, but it's really fun to hear what's going on around the world with all the different musicians. So thanks again for the feedback. Absolutely. And send yours in. We do have, we've got actually quite a few more emails from, uh, from people that aren't Kevin, uh, but Kevin's all seem to fit uh, for, for an episode today, but we've got some other stuff in the queue. So if you've sent one in, you haven't heard us talk about it. It's there. We have not lost it. So trust us on that, but we want you to send more in every episode. We'd like to have some listener feedback that we can share and talk with you folks about. It really helps. Like Paul said, it helps really frame what we're doing here and it makes the show more about you and that's what we're doing. So, yep. Yavol. All right. Well, that's what we got for this week. We'll see you next week because that's how we do it. Watch those lukewarm burgers and always be performing. Always. Even when you even right after you've eaten a crappy yeah. lukewarm burger. Especially then. Especially then. Yeah. Show them it doesn't matter. Not that they pay any attention. But whatever. <laughs> <laughs>